All right. So my first question, I was reading the bios on the back of the book and I was giggling to myself because the well i'll let you guys tell the story so how how did you go from i guess living life as usual to talking about sex with each other and to all of us as a full-time job (laughs) so uh, the book is called sex talks the reason that i am a sex therapist is because of my awkward sex talk with my parents oh yeah i was very struck when they tried to give me the talk just very struck by how embarrassed they were how awkward and uncomfortable it was and i did not know sex therapy was a career at the time but i felt very inspired to help make sex easier to talk about i just felt like this is something normal why shouldn't we be able to talk about it so i started creating this whole career path for myself becoming licensed starting to see clients And then starting to create an online business of guides and courses. And I asked Xander for a little bit of help (laughs) with um, some like creating an Excel spreadsheet for me. And he had a lot of fun doing it. And I was like, you know, this business is really growing. There's a lot of stuff that I need help with on the back end. And so he became the operations manager, helping me run everything behind the scenes so I could focus on the content. And I just had this feeling from right when we started working together that we needed to talk about our sex life and our relationship as a couple. We've been together for 15 years. We've had plenty of our own ups and downs, so many challenges in the bedroom. And I really wanted us to be able to talk about that. But Xander did not want to. <laughs> I'll let you share why. Well, I, I was I was a little hesitant. I was like, well, I'm I'm not an expert. You've studied, you know, your whole life for this. This is this is your career. And, you know, who am I to be giving people advice? And I was I was really focused on like, oh, you know, I need I need to be an expert to have anything to say. And what I slowly came to realize as Vanessa got me more and more involved in like, you know, answering a question on an Instagram story here and there, I started to realize like, oh, people aren't actually looking for me as an expert. People are looking to hear from me as a husband, as a partner, as a guy. Like, what's my perspective as the person who doesn't have any education on this topic, who doesn't have, you know, experience or whatever? Just like, what is this like in everyday life for someone in a relationship? Is it difficult? Okay, so I have a PhD in psychology, was nothing to do with sex. It was like attachment and things like that. But I'm always curious because I will start up these conversations with my husband. He's a surgeon, so like opposite ends. And so like I have the background, I have the language, I have the, you know, and so I'm curious when before you were involved in this and you would strike up a conversation about sex with him, What was that dynamic like as because it it must be different from a couple who neither of them are experts. Do you Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Yeah, it was very bad. (laughs) (laughs) I had a lot of imposter syndrome because, you know, here I had decided I wanted to do this career in sex therapy. I wanted to help people. And when we met, We had that very typical story that so many couples do. Like it was super hot and heavy. Mm -hmm. The chemistry seemed undeniable. Things just really worked between the two of us. And then a couple of years into it, life caught up with us and it was not so hot and heavy. We were going longer stretches of time, not having sex. The sex that we were having was pretty boring and predictable and routine. And so I I was the first one to start trying to talk about it. I realized, like, I don't like this. What happened to us? What happened to that amazing chemistry we used Mm -hmm. to have? And I did all the wrong thing. I mean, you know, I, I complained about it. I blamed it on him. I approached it in a really negative kind of attacking way Mm -hmm. often. So, you know, it's, yeah, it's important to me to just be vulnerable and share a lot of the lessons that I've shared in sex talks. We've learned the hard way. Oh, we've, yeah. we've learned by doing all the wrong things. And honestly, once we got through that time period, it made me even more motivated to share these techniques with people because I realized I wasn't prepared, even training to become a sex therapist. I wasn't prepared to have those conversations in my own relationship. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's one thing to talk about this stuff academically or theoretically or mm-hmm. when it's about other people and not about us because that was the struggle that I went through. It's like, 
before I was involved in, you know, the like the front facing part of what we do, like we, you know, Vanessa would talk to me about just general struggles that, you know, people are having and stuff. And, and when you're talking about when I'm talking about that with her, I'm like, okay, well, these, these people have a problem and, but I don't have a problem. Everything is, you know, you, you look at what other people are struggling with as a way to almost justify like what is okay with you or what you're doing right. And so it can be really hard to flip it around and be like, huh, do I see any of myself in what's going on with these people? And it, yeah, it took me a long time. It took us a long time of struggling with our own stuff before I was really willing to be like, hmm, maybe there are some areas where I could improve my communication, where I could improve other aspects of my life that are going to lead to us being closer and having more fun in bed. Is there, so most of my listeners have little kids. Um, so that you just, that, you know, makes like, I, I find a lot of people had their relationship before kids and it was a certain way. And then when you have small kids, especially like sex just kind of falls to the backside. Cause it's easy. Everybody's tired, exhausted. There's little kids running around. Um, so this is a perfect, like my audience is perfect <laughs> for this <laughs> conversation. Is there any, like you were saying, you would look at other people's situations and be like, oh, like that's a problem, but we're okay. How do people even know if there is a problem? And is a problem for me going to look different from a problem to somebody else? Like, what is the, like, how do you measure? Is it just like, are you fulfilled or not? Is that the, the, the question? Sometimes sexual problems feel very obvious. I'm not having any orgasms. I don't like sex. Mm. We're not having sex very frequently. We're fighting about sex whenever we do talk about it. But oftentimes what we've found is that it feels a lot subtler than that. You just get this kind of sense of, shouldn't there be more to it than this? Like, And I can't even put my finger on what that should be or what I want it to be, but it's this sense that something is missing. But we are also trying to promote the idea with sex talks that you don't just have to talk about your sex life when things are bad or wrong. And it's actually incredibly fun and very connecting to talk about your sex life, even when things are amazing. So a lot of the conversations in sex talks are very positively framed and, you know, help you connect. The first chapter is called, I love it, it's called Destroying the Fucking Fairy Tale. <laughs> so can you explain a little bit about what you mean by that? The fucking fairy tale <laughs> is the sex scenes that we see over and over again on TV and in the movies. And we all know exactly how the scene plays out. It's like characters, they just look at each other. No one ever initiates oh, yeah. sex. You just look and it's on. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> You're dashing into the bedroom. Ten seconds later, clothes are flying. <laughs> oh, my God. It's like it's like the the falling all over the hallway to get to yes, the bedroom. Yeah, it, like sex in the city. You make it into the bed. Yeah, yeah. you're <laughs> bumping into doors. There's like, you know, holes in your wall. Yeah. I know. I'm always like, I, I, well, that's never happened to me. Like, I feel left out. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, it's like 10 seconds of tumbling around in the sheets. And both partners have an orgasm at the exact same time. Mm. Everybody's wildly satisfied. And most importantly, nobody had to talk about any of it. So when we see this scene replayed for our entire lives, of course, we're going to internalize that that's what our sex life should look like. And of course, we're going to start worrying and feeling afraid of what does it mean that my sex life doesn't look like that? So we wanted to kick the book off by really normalizing, like if your sex life does not look the way it does in movies, you're fine. Ours doesn't either. And so it's, you know, it's very similar to a lot of us see love stories in movies and you know that motherhood partner, yeah the partner who like knight in shining armor saves you knows you better than you know yourself it's the same sort of vibe like yeah. we're just fed a lot of lies about how life really works or like yeah you you have one little minor conflict and you almost break up and then you figure it out and then you live happily ever after mm -hmm. like there's this idea that okay we're allowed to have like one or two little tiffs right at the beginning but then we just figure it out. We get married. It's all good forever. And yeah, unfortunately, that's not really the experience that any of us actually have. You talked about something in that chapter called sexual 
perfectionism mm -hmm. is does that stem from that internalized belief that sex looks a certain way absolutely yeah I and mean, a lot of us are familiar with perfectionism outside mm -hmm. of the bedroom but i coined the term sexual perfectionism because we really see it coming up in the bedroom as well where people feel like they want every moment of a sexual interaction to be perfect i want it to look exactly the way that it looks in movies and that really hinders us from wanting to communicate about it to even wanting to try anything new because we're afraid. What if I try something new and it doesn't go well and I look foolish? Also comes up a lot around body image, especially mm -hmm. for us women. Like, I don't want to try that sex position because maybe my boobs are going to look floppy and weird hanging over or they're going to slide into my armpits if I'm on <laughs> my back. So there are a lot of ways that sexual perfectionism ruins our sex life. And um, you talked about awkwardness, how that's like... What did you call it? The admission? The price of admission. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love that because, and is this something that couples come to you with, like, like feeling awkward in the bedroom? And do you explain that that's part of it? We have all experienced awkwardness in the bedroom. And, you know, we're not going to say it's ever going to be pleasant to feel, but we do say that awkwardness is the price mm -hmm. of admission for having an amazing sex life. If we all get so fixated on, I don't want to have a single awkward moment. I don't want to put a single toe out of place. <laughs> you're not going to have sex that feels very good at all. It's going to feel incredibly stressful and just filled with pressure. So instead, we like to just normalize the awkward moments and say, and we speak to a lot of those awkward moments that have come up for us mm -hmm. that have come up for other people because a lot of People have just never heard people talk about awkward moments. <laughs> I mean, one of the, the most interesting things I've been getting feedback about in the book is there's a line where I just mentioned having toilet paper bits stuck on your labia. Oh. And so many people have reached out and said, I have, I'm actually in tears reading over this. I've never heard anybody talk about this. <laughs> I thought I was just some weirdo who can't seem to get all the toilet paper cleaned up. So it's just, you know, it's moments like that, normalizing like, yeah. Sometimes it's stuck there. It's okay. <laughs> but here's here's the thing with awkwardness is the way to get through awkwardness is is actually to lean into it. It's to acknowledge it. Like, hey, we just tried that. It didn't quite go the way that we planned. I felt a little awkward. You know, it's it's actually vocalizing the feelings that you're having rather than saying, No, I'm not allowed to have this feeling. I'm not, this isn't supposed to happen with us. It's just, hey, yeah, let's let's work through that. That felt a little awkward. And when you do that, then the next time you do that thing, it's going to feel a little less awkward because you, mm -hmm. you know, you've built some connection around that. Maybe it's something that you can laugh about now. So we like to try to say, hey, actually, don't avoid awkwardness, like lean into it. If it's awkward, that's good. That means that you have an opportunity for connection and you have an opportunity to try that thing again and again, and it will get less awkward and less awkward and hopefully better and better, too. So I'm assuming, like you were saying before, a lot of couples, it's not necessarily that there's something outwardly wrong, but it's like, it's a little bit like boring. I feel like we could be doing more. So if, like, if people pick up this book and they start exploring new things, I think you have to expect the awkwardness because it's like you're practicing a new thing with somebody else. So over time, it's going to get less and less awkward. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, we have a rule that we call the first pancake rule. So, you know, when you're making pancakes, the first one just always turns out always, a little strange. Yeah, yeah. It sucks. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, the rest come out great, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we like calling anytime you try something new in the bedroom, the first pancake and acknowledging it with each other and just sort of saying, OK, this is our first pancake. We don't the expectations are low for this one. We might be tossing it out, <laughs> um, but it's just such a great way to help prevent yourself from getting into that perfectionistic mindset and thinking like, oh, my God, I have to try this thing that has to go amazing the first time. Like, take all that pressure off. Just call it the first pancake. Yeah. And I guess to have fun with it instead of taking it so seriously. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. So you talk about something called a sexual user manual, and I think that was with regard to like understanding your libido and your sex drive type. So can you explain what you mean by that and also why understanding that about yourself and your partner is important? 
Yeah, if you've ever felt like, I just wish I had a user manual to how my partner operated or how I operated, like I just wish someone could explain this to me, that's what you create in the first section of the book. You get to understand yourself better so that you can share that with your partner and the two of you can have these more productive conversations. So one aspect of the user manual is understanding what your sex drive type is. And this is such an interesting conversation because most people don't realize that there are two. When we see it in the fucking fairy tale, we only see one of the types, which is spontaneous sex drive. That's when sex just randomly hops into your mind, pops into your mind. You go have it in that moment. Everybody gets excited. (laughs) So the two different types, though, really boil down to where you feel desire first. Do you feel it mentally? Like the idea of it pops into your head? Spontaneous. Not spontaneous, or do you feel it in your body first? Like you have to be turned on, physically aroused before the idea of it sounds good. And that's the second type, which is called responsive. So most women are responsive. And if you've ever been in the middle of sex or even at the end of sex and you caught yourself thinking, this is fun. Why don't I ever want to do this? That's a classic sign that you're responsive. This is a story of my life. Okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> like I could be like during the day, I'll be like, yeah, like, yeah, we should have sex tonight. And then tonight comes and I'm like, eh, like, I'm just going to go to bed. But then mm-hmm. every time, and we laugh about this all the time because every time we are intimate, we're like, hmm, we should do this more often. And I'll like come up with this uh-huh. like big idea. Like, you know what we should do? We should be intimate. For 30 days in a row, every single day, my husband's like, okay, like, calm down. (laughs) (laughs) But that is so common for women. Like, why, why, once you get started, it's enjoyable. And then I, I guess you switch to like being mentally turned on as well. So are men typically the opposite? Typically men are spontaneous where sex will just randomly pop into their heads. So people always tell me like, okay, but spontaneous sounds better. Like, why can't I be that? (laughs) The challenge for spontaneous types, though, is that they might be into the idea of sex, but their body might not have caught up. So Mm. a guy who can't get hard, maybe he's struggling with his orgasms, his timing around that. That's the challenge of having a spontaneous sex drive. So the challenge of having a responsive is that if you catch a responsive type and just ask, like, do you want to have sex right now? You're almost always going to say no. Your mind is just like, no, that doesn't sound good. No, sorry. So a lot of responsive types will think of themselves as being low or even no desire, but they just don't understand that's just how your sex drive works. Your body needs to have some sort of stimulation first. And then your brain catches up and thinks like, oh, yeah, this is feeling good. I do want to continue. So what's your advice for people who are responsive, who want to like. So we don't want to ask, like, do you want to have sex? Because the answer is almost always going to be no. So what you want to do instead is focus on having some sort of physical contact with each other. So it's going to be different for every couple, but you have to decide what sort of contact you feel comfortable doing. So maybe it's that you're just going to make out. Maybe your partner is going to give you a massage. Maybe you're going to use a toy on each other, whatever it is. Um, But to get started with the understanding of how your drive works and understanding like, okay, I'm going to see if I'm open to the possibility that I might get turned on. I'm not feeling the desire right now, but like, let me, let me let my body have the chance to do its thing, start feeling some pleasure, and then I'll see. So you're sort of delaying the question. It's not like, hey, you're fully clothed right now and we're outside of the bedroom. Do you want to have sex? It's, we're, we're delaying it down to your body is already warmed up. You're feeling good. Are you interested in going further? But yeah, I think the, the key with that one is, you know, it's so important to be able to have this whole conversation so that you can set clear boundaries around okay we're going to try this approach but but mm-hmm. when we do it is not a guarantee that oh once we start the massage it's mm-hmm. definitely going to lead to intercourse mm. because i think especially if you know there's one spontaneous type and one responsive type that can be the worry is that okay well yeah but like when he starts massaging massaging me like we all know where that goes and so that's that's where the conversation comes in is talking through like okay like i am up i'm up for this but we both have to be okay with it only being this. And, and I think if you talk to, you know, most people who are spontaneous, they will tell you if they have the option of, okay, we're going to have less makeout sessions. We're only going to do makeout sessions when my partner guarantees they want sex. 
Mm. Or we're going to have more makeout sessions. Some of them will lead to sex and some of them won't. The vast majority of people are going to choose that second option, which is just the more physical contact. So is this a conversation? I have heard this just from listeners. I've experienced it in past relationships where, and it's usually, I think, like one partner, it's usually the the man having like the spontaneous sex drive, maybe a higher libido, and then the woman being the opposite. Um, and like you were saying, it's that expectation, like even, you know, like, <clears throat> sitting next to each other on the couch, like rubbing my like my leg or like giving me a, a big long hug. When there's that expectation of, okay, this is gonna, they want this to lead to sex. It makes the partner that is, you know, has the lower sex drive almost like push them away. And like, I don't even want to just kiss you anymore or like lay down with you on the couch because I don't want to get to the point where I now have to be like rejecting sex. So this is such an important conversation if people find themselves in that kind of dynamic of a relationship. So what does that conversation yeah. look like? When So when couples don't talk about it, it leads exactly to what you're talking about. And we call this the bristle reaction. You can feel yourself bristling up when your partner comes in to touch you because you know where it's headed and you you don't want it to go in that way. So that's why couples need to talk about, you know, hey, this is my sex drive. This is how it works. So how can we work together with whatever our sex drive types are to initiate sex in a way that's going to feel like an invitation to each of us, but not with the pressure? So the, the question that Xander was just mentioning, it's such a great one for couples to pose to each other, especially if you're the lower you feel like you're the lower desire partner, maybe you're actually just responsive and not actually lower. <laughs> but to say to your partner, yeah, okay, so I'm learning this about myself. My body needs to be turned on before I'm going to think that the idea of sex sounds good. And I can imagine that there are going to be some times where I'm open to being intimate and then I want to go further. And sometimes where I'm open to being intimate and then I just want it to end there. So what would you rather that we have some of those moments or that we are only ever physically intimate when I tell you I'm fully on board for everything <laughs> and that's going to be way, way, way less frequent. So just having it out in the open and feeling like a choice to you and your partner, it can be very powerful. The other thing that we like to mention when it comes to the bristle reaction is that that it is so much more likely that you get into that dynamic when your relationship becomes a bit more touch starved. Like if you are not having mm -hmm very much or really any physical contact other than physical contact that leads to sex, then of course you're going to make that association. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. Well, he's touching me. It must, it must be sex. And so it's so important if you are identifying that dynamic in your relationship to think about ways to introduce more non, non-sexual physical touch into your relationship so that, so that you stop having that reaction you break the connection between oh any sort of physical contact means my partner wants more so that mm -hmm. yeah the more non-sexual touch you have throughout the day the more you break that yeah connection. well because on the flip side too for for the person you know for the person who's not having the bristle reaction it also creates a you know a, a problematic dynamic as well which is that you know they are missing having physical touch and they're missing having physical intimacy and so any moment when they receive the smallest amount of touch from you, then they want to go from zero to 60, like immediately mm -hmm. because they're like, oh my God, it's happening. It's happening. And, then, <laughs> and, and that, le I mean, and that leads, you know, that leads to sex. It probably only prioritizes them. It's probably over really quickly. It's not very enjoyable. And it just, you know, furthers, you know, it, it's like a, you digging, know, you dig yeah, you're digging yourself deeper. deeper into the hole. Cause you're like, well, that wasn't very good. Yeah, I don't want to I don't want to do that again. So I'm going to push them away more, you know, then I'm, I'm going to avoid touch even more. So we got to yeah, we got to back out of that. It's like a vicious cycle and yeah. <laughs> it always comes down to like you need to have a conversation about it and a lot of people don't have these conversations. They just you know, keep going through the same cycle. You know, the idea of talking about sex is nothing new. Like when you're up late at night Googling, you know, we're not having sex. It's at the end of every article you see. Talk to your partner about it. 
that most of us just don't know how to have these conversations, us included, many years ago. You know, what do I say? How do I say it? When do I say it? So that was the issue that we really wanted to solve in the book is it's not just a bunch of talk about it, talk about it. We show you exactly how to talk about it. Here's what to say. Here's an exercise you can do that can make it feel fun and easier. So we're giving you that very practical step-by-step how-to rather than just the generic oh, advice. Yeah. And, and it's not just here's how to talk about it when you're having this problem. It's like, here's how we talk about it just in everyday, day-to-day life when things are good, when things are neutral, whatever. Because mm-hmm. I mean, that's the other huge mistake most people make is they go, cool, I'm not going to talk about it. I'm not going to talk about it. Ooh, now we're having a problem. It's getting worse. All right. Now we got to we, we got to sit down and we got to talk. And those are the words that nobody wants to hear. Everyone gets on mm-hmm. guard, right? Like no one wants to hear that. We need to talk. <laughs> so so, yeah, no, the, the key is is not waiting for the big problem. Mm-hmm. It's figuring out how do we just infuse this, you know, casual mentions of sex throughout the day. Yeah. Like just make it a part of your relationship. It's like it's like the idea of going to therapy, right? People often wait until there's this big glaring issue when you should look at it like maintenance almost. So in the book, there's five conversations that you guys outline. Um, My first question before we talk a little bit about those conversations is, are they like, do you start at number one and work through number five or does it matter which order you go in? We think it's going to be best to start at one and go through. We put them in a specific order for that reason. We we really wanted to ease people into it and get you a little bit of practice, get you feeling comfortable. That being said, you can skip around for sure. If there's something that you feel really drawn to, you can. But I think most couples, it would be best to just go through in the order. And is there a timeline? Like, are we going through all these conversations in... Uh, like a month? Like, is there homework to work on before you get to the next stage? Like, how does that work? Each conversation is broken up into little exercises that, you know, you can have a quick conversation about it, a quick check-in about something. So you're never having the Mm -hmm. dreaded, we need to sit down (laughs) for two hours, clear the calendars. We got to talk through all this stuff. Um, So and couples can really work through it on whatever timeline they want. I mean, we've had the book just came out last week. We've had people already finished it. Oh, wow. Incredible. We're so connected. And other people who are saying, yeah, we're working through bit by bit whenever we have a little bit of spare time or we're setting up a a weekly date night to read Mm -hmm. a chapter of the book together and talk about it. And we also wrote it recognizing that people are going to, you know, within a a couple, like people are going to be on different timelines. And so, you know, obviously the ideal way to do this would be both partners are reading the book at the same time, going through, you know, chapter by chapter and doing the exercises together. But we also recognize that that's not going to be possible in every single relationship. And so there are ways to do this, whether it's just one partner is reading the book and the other partner knows they're reading the book, or even if just one partner wants to read the book. I think we offer a lot of suggestions for how to just casually infuse these conversations without without it being like, oh, I read this in this book and we have to do it this way, or you know, we have to follow these five steps or or whatever. Mm-hmm. So we try to make it really accessible to to people in all different stages of their relationship in different places and you know for couples with differing attitudes towards towards working on their relationship. Because we were there ourselves. I wanted to talk about it and Xander was not ready to talk yep. about it. So we've been there too. <laughs> Do you have advice? Let's say someone is even nervous to start with the first conversation because this is so foreign to them. They've never approached their partner about sex or anything. Is there something or is there advice that you would give them on how to bring it up to their partner that they want to go through this book or like to even bring it up? I love using podcasts as an excuse to bring something up. I was listening to this podcast today, my favorite podcast, and (laughs) she had these guests on, (laughs) you know, their book sounded really interesting. So if you blame it on something external, blame it on me, guys. Yeah, it's just like, yeah, I just happened to listen to this episode. So I think that's a great way to introduce it. 
But I will say the first conversation we knew people were going to feel embarrassed and awkward going into it. So we really designed it to be a baby step. So the first conversation is acknowledgement, like sex is a thing. We have it. You're just getting comfortable with sex as a topic of conversation. So you're not making any requests. You're not making any complaints. You're not talking about any problems you guys have had. You're not trying to do anything with the conversations other than just actually get comfortable saying the words out loud. So a really practical thing that anybody could do after listening to this episode is take a minute to think about one of your favorite sexual memories with your partner and then share it with them today. So you can have a face-to-face conversation. Mm -hmm. You can shoot it uh, to them over a text if you're feeling a little bit shy, but that's all you're doing. It's like, remember that trip that we took together, that hotel room that we were staying in? That just (laughs) popped into my mind randomly today and it made me smile and I wanted to share it with you. That's it. Yeah. My, (laughs) I was just thinking, I had this book on my coffee table for a while and my mamere was here. She's 78. Um, And she was like, oh, what's this book? And I was like, oh, like the authors are coming on the podcast. Like I'm talking to them next week. And she's like, well, this is great. This is great. Oh. Everybody should read this. Oh. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, so cute. So I thought what we could do is just go through the five different conversations and you could give like a cliff notes of mm-hmm. what that conversation is for and a little bit about why it's important. So the first one was yeah. ag- acknowledgement. Acknowledgement. You're just getting comfortable and sharing positive memories and experiences with each other to help you realize sex is something that can be fun and playful to talk about. It doesn't have to be solving a problem or anything like that. So there's some other fun exercises in there just to get more comfortable and build that foundation of positive experiences. Yeah, I think this one is is so, so fundamental and necessary for everyone, because if you if you skip over this one and you go to any of the other ones, if you don't regularly talk about sex, if that's not a safe topic in your relationship, then, you know, we, when your partner hears that you're bringing up, you know, uh, something about how you, how you guys feel connection with each other or, or how, you know, your desire or pleasure or something they're in the back of their mind, they're going to be thinking like, huh, like what, like where, what are they getting at with this? Like, why are they bringing mm-hmm. this up now? But if you talk about sex all the time, then it's not going to feel weird or mm-hmm. you're not going to, there's not going to be any inference like, oh, like, what are they really meaning here? So that's yeah. just why we want, we want sex to become a topic of conversation, just like you talk about what's for dinner, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. the second conversation is called connection. What do we need to feel close to each other? We wanted to include this one because a lot of us compartmentalize our sex lives. We think of sex as like it's this thing that we do in the bedroom, in the dark, at the end of the night. But the reality is that the connection that we're feeling with each other or not feeling with each other throughout the day really impacts our desire to be physically intimate with each other. And so we wanted to share with couples strategies for maintaining that connection throughout the day. So many couples will tell us, you know, we just feel more like we're roommates rather than Mm. romantic partners, especially parents and especially parents with young children. You know, it feels like we're just we're two ships passing in the night. We're co-parenting. And so we want to help people regain that connection so that intimacy doesn't feel like this huge leap. Like you get into bed at the end of the night and it's like, Ah, who are you? (laughs) You know, we've been feeling so disconnected. So this is all about very practical ways. So I think, you know, of course, it'd be great if we could all jet off for a two week long private vacation couples retreat, but that's just not realistic for most people. So what are little things that we can do on a daily basis to maintain that connection? So there is some stuff about love languages in there. um, But one of my favorite tips and another super practical thing that people can start doing is practicing gratitude for your partner. So all of us have heard the word gratitude. A lot of us are kind of like, yeah, yeah, okay, whatever. (laughs) But gratitude has actually been found to be the number one predictor of marital success. And the fascinating thing about gratitude is it's very easy to do. It takes me two seconds to tell Xander, hey, I saw that you unloaded the dishwasher. I really appreciate that. Oh, thanks. (laughs) (laughs) But it has a very big, (laughs) thanks for the role play. It has a really big impact because you know, so often in long-term relationships, we 
only notice the things that our partner does wrong, the things that annoy us about them, that frustrate us. And we're very quick and easy to call those things out. But gratitude has actually been shown to help couples feel closer together and even for you to feel good yourself when you're giving that appreciation to your partner. Hmm. And is it important? Because just as you were talking, like, I'm very good. I obviously work from home. So I notice little things that my husband has has done or like taking care of it in my mind. I'm like, oh, man, he's the best. Like this is the, the or like I'll go to my mom's for a week for a visit and I'll know I'm like, oh, my God, I forgot the monitor, but he had packed it in the suitcase. And I'm like, ah, oh, like he's the best. But I don't necessarily verbalize it to him. So is it important to say it to your partner so that they know? Absolutely. Yeah. And and this is something that might take a little bit of getting used to. A lot of us just aren't used to sharing those things. So for a while, Xander mm. was putting reminders on his phone to like say something oh, nice to Vanessa, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, because I, I, the reality is, is that like when we haven't talked about it, when we don't know like what types of things are going to make our partner feel most connected to us, we tend to do the things or just operate assuming that like they work the way that we work. And so, you know, for me, compliments are nice. Like I appreciate them, but I, I'm not, you know, it doesn't make my day when I get like a compliment from Vanessa, whereas Vanessa really loves it when I compliment her. And so it took me a long time to really understand, oh, this giving a compliment feels kind of un like, giving a small compliment feels unnatural to me because it's not something that I'm like looking for day in and day out. But when I give them to her, she has such a great reaction to mm. it. She has she has such a, a great, you know, great rest of the day. And so I I had to really, you know, create a habit around, oh, this is something that for me, it wouldn't feel as meaningful, but for her, it's going to feel super, super meaningful. So I think it's just identifying like, oh, okay, this isn't the way that I work naturally. That doesn't mean that I can't do it for someone else. But I do have to recognize that I need to train myself to do that for someone else, because of course, I'm not going to think of it naturally. Yeah. I need to ask my husband if he would appreciate compliments. <laughs> Because I was just thinking, like, he's very much an acts of service kind of person. Mm -hmm. But if you're not, if, like, the only thing that I, uh, like, acknowledge is, like, you stomp upstairs when you walk around. Like, can you do it, qu like, quieter? <laughs> it's really annoying. But he's done, like, X, Y, and Z throughout the day. He's only hearing, like, you know, like, can you do this? Instead mm -hmm. of, like, oh, thanks for doing that. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. There's some really fascinating research from John Gottman where they took a look at the ratio of positive to negative comments in a relationship. And they found that healthy relationships need to have five positive comments for every one negative one. And that's even when the relationship's in a good place. When you're having conflict and things are tense between the two of you, it's more like 20 to one. Mm. So it's an interesting question for everybody to ask themselves. Like, do I give my partner at least five positive compliments for every one time that I complain about things that they do? I mean, I know even for myself, I'm like, oh, shoot, I don't, know. <laughs> I don't know how that ratio is right now. I want to get off this recording. I got to shoot a lot of compliments. At him, but <laughs> it's, just, it's just very easy for us to get more fixated on the negative and the frustrations. Than yeah. The okay. I love that. So the third conversation is all about desire. So this conversation is going to help you identify what you need to feel turned on and excited about sex and for sex to feel like an invitation. So in most long-term relationships, initiation has become very fraught and complicated. So most of us will initiate by just saying like, well, should we do it? In a while. It's been a while. <laughs> and it's not exciting. It's not exciting at all. So parts of this conversation are understanding your sex drive type and being able to, to talk to each other about that. Uh, we also came up with a model about uh, called the, your initiation style. It's similar to the love languages. And like we all like to give and receive in different ways. Like we all like to have sex initiated in different ways. So on top of understanding what your sex drive type needs, it's also understanding what kind of initiation is going to work best for you. So one example of one of the types is called play with me. 
So you're the type where you want initiation to feel more playful. You don't necessarily need it to feel super serious and like seductive or anything mm -hmm. like that. So we do a lot of play with me type initiation. Like we'll, we make really dumb sexual innuendo jokes. Like we can turn anything <laughs> into a sexual innuendo. That's what <laughs> she just, said. Yeah. <laughs> Like, it feels like a way that we can flirt with each other throughout the day, but we'll also, we'll make bets on things and whoever's the winner gets to choose what kind of sex they want. Um, sometimes we'll have like um, an inside joke that we might text to each other or like a, an emoji, something like that. So we can be more playful with it. So it's understanding what kind of initiation is going to feel exciting to you. Hmm. Well, how do you guys feel about scheduling sex? Is that, that's okay? I love scheduling sex. I think it's a really great option. You know, it gets it does get a very bad rep. I think a lot of people think of it as being very boring. Like, oh, man, your sex life is pretty bad if you have to schedule sex. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, there are some very boring ways to do Absolutely. scheduling sex that probably can create more problems than and they're going to solve. Yeah. So if you're looking at scheduling it the way that you have to schedule your dentist appointment, of course, that's going to feel awful. But I, we always like to turn it around on people and tell them like, okay, think back to the early stages of your relationship. Most of us had really great, fun, early few months together, right? But what were you doing? What were you really doing in those first few months? You were scheduling <laughs> with each other. You want to come and over? when you started being intimate, <laughs> yeah. you, you were pretty clear that like when we're scheduling a date, we're going to have sex on that date, right? That's so true. But we didn't feel judgmental of it it was exciting to schedule something like oh yeah i've got it like it's on the calendar yeah, it's not like, i'm gonna see them again <laughs> what's wrong like what's wrong with you you <laughs> like you you're planning a date i know yeah. how dare you <laughs> that's so true yeah because so once you live together and you're literally living life together mm -hmm. you you don't have the opportunity to be like especially when you have little kids it's hard to be like oh we're gonna plan a date or I'm going to meet you for dinner and then we're going to go because like mm -hmm. you live in the same house and you have a child's next yeah. door. <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's it makes sense now that you say that. Yeah. So it's like we can change our attitude about the planning and look at it as something that's fun and exciting in a way that we're prioritizing our partner. Like we schedule every other aspect of our lives and we don't judge ourselves like if you're one of your kids has a soccer game, you're not going to judge yourself for putting that in your calendar. You're like, mm -hmm. that's important to me. I want to make sure I'm there. That's no. why I put it in the we'll calendar. Just see, we'll just see if we remember. If we make it to the game, great. If yeah. not, whatever. <laughs> Said no one ever. Yeah. <laughs> one of my friends, they schedule date nights. And so it's just tonight, it's like known by both of them that they're going to like not have their phones. They're going to you know, mm -hmm. order in food after the kids go to bed and like share a bottle of wine. Like it's just date yeah. night. And so you can call it date night instead of scheduling sex. Exactly. Yes. Just that yeah. little word change can make yeah. a big difference. So that's another little assignment that people could do after listening to this podcast. If you want to give yourself the chance to like build up some anticipation, mm -hmm. some excitement, just schedule a little date night. And even if you're really busy or overwhelmed, put 30 minutes on the mm -hmm. calendar. If, like mm -hmm. after the kids are in bed, we're going to have a glass of wine. We're going to play a board game. We're going to do a puzzle together, you know, whatever it is. But just put something on the calendar and, and see if you can get yourself excited about spending that time together. I think the other hang up that a lot of us have is is the word sex. We think, oh, scheduling sex there means then that we're like guaranteeing that we're going to have intercourse, and especially, you know, between you know, male, female couples. We tend to use intercourse and sex completely interchangeably. When we say sex, we mean intercourse. but you know, there can be so many other options on the menu. And so in, instead of saying, oh, we're scheduling sex or scheduling intercourse, like we're not, we don't, we don't want to advocate that anyone is guaranteeing they're going to do forcing anything. Yeah. Forcing to yourself way. to do something. It's more, you know, like you were just describing with your friends, you're scheduling a date night. We are, you know, we're promising each other that we are going to have some baseline level of intimacy. You know, anything else on top of that is a bonus, but it's not like, Oh God, now I have to do that thing that I'm not sure that I'm really up mm -hmm. for. Like that's 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 not what we are advocating at all. And I think that's where a lot of people's minds go when they hear mm -hmm. scheduling sex. And so of course it's just like, oh God, no, I don't want to do that at all. Yeah, it's like if we have sex, great. If we fall asleep 
on the couch, great, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so the fourth the conversation is about pleasure. What do we each need to feel good to have a satisfying experience? So this is a question that trips a lot of us up. Like if you were just to ask a random person, you know, what do you want during sex? A lot of us would just freeze up like, I, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> you know. I don't know how to describe it. I don't know what I want. So we put a lot of fun exercises and prompts and stuff like that in this chapter to help people get to know themselves better, what they're looking for. So one of the things in there, there's another um, personality types model, the sex personality type, understanding what makes sex feel good to you, what makes for a satisfying and, and enjoy, enjoyable experience. So that's a great way to get a conversation started. We also talk a lot in that chapter about the orgasm gap that occurs between male and female relationships where men are having a lot more orgasms than mm -hmm. women are having. And we make the connection between our enjoyment of sex and our desire for it. And I think this is something so important for people to understand is that if you're not having an enjoyable experience with sex, why would you crave it? Yeah. Why would you have a sky high sex drive for something that feels like it's more about my partner than it is for me. I don't really get anything out of it. You know, like, why would you have a high sex drive? So very often mismatched sex drives or low sex drives, it's not actually about the drive. It's about your enjoyment of it. So we share some very practical ways for male-female partnerships to make sure that women are experiencing more pleasure during sex. Hmm. And the last one is exploration. What are we going to try next? Mm. <laughs> so research has found that trying new things with our partner is the best way to keep the spark alive in and outside of the bedroom. But a lot of us get very tripped up <laughs> when it comes to trying new things. We automatically think it has to be something wildly kinky, some fantasy that we've never shared with our partner before. But in this chapter, we share that even small changes can actually make a really big difference. And we recommend starting with small things, too, so that you build up some confidence around it. Doesn't mean you have to throw out everything that you like or everything that works for you. It's just continuing to have a new experience with your partner, make little adjustments, little shifts. So something as simple as maybe you have a favorite sex position. Could you try putting a pillow under your hips? Or could you try resting your weight on the other side of your body, like moving around a little bit? So little things like that can make a big, big difference. And we also have in that chapter a whole menu of new oh. things that you can try. I know a lot of people are like, I, OK, I know I should be trying new things, but I don't know what to try. I feel self-conscious, <laughs> kind of embarrassed. Yeah, no one's so ever we, told me the <laughs> options till yeah. now. So we give you we give you the options. So it's a really fun exercise that you can go through separately and then you come together to compare your list and say like, oh, OK, what are the things that we should try out? I love that. Well, this was a great conversation. I love this. Um, it is so needed. We sh I wish we could have recorded it before so I could put it out on Valentine's. But guys, we're <laughs> recording this on Valentine's Day. So just. Keep that in mind as you listen. <laughs> um, so to end, I guess you could tell everybody where they can find you online, where they can purchase the book. And you guys have a podcast, right? We do. Yeah. So you can find the book at sextalksbook.com, sextalksbook.com. We have links to all the major retailers. And then if you come back to that page after you purchase it, just enter your order number and we'll send you a free workbook that goes even deeper into the book. You can also use it as a book club guide if you want to read it with a bunch of girlfriends and talk about it. So that's a really fun little resource. And then we are most active on Instagram. We're at Vanessa and Xander. We show up and do stories together mm -hmm. every day. We've got a lot of ridiculous, like funny content. Really. We, try to, we try to bring that playful energy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you want to tell them about the podcast? Yeah, our podcast is called Pillow Talks. It's uh, Vanessa and I talking about various aspects <laughs> of sex and relationships every single week. Oh, I love that. Well, thanks so much for coming on, guys. This was super informative, and I'm excited to... To, to make my way through the conversations. <laughs> Thank you so much yeah, for thanks. having us.